on this slide because you can sort of see it from overhead is really building up the ecology lots of hedgerows agroecology and you can see there's hedgerows in between the uh, cash crops and the last thing we do is just intensive production you can see that every bed here is being utilized and every bed is at a different state of production so things are being moved over very quickly. And as a result of that, even though our farm is, is small in terms of acreage, three acres of production, we are grossing about 100,000 per acre. And that's been the last four years. So that's a little bit of our background. We've been on this property for 10 years. Uh, about 40% of our product goes out through a CSA. We have 120 member CSA. Uh, that's weekly, May through Thanksgiving, and then every other week through the winter, which is really lovely. It's really important for us that we go through the winter, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, and then about 50% goes out through farmers markets, and then a little 10% goes out through restaurants. Paul and I met in West Africa. He was doing agroforestry. I was doing nutrition, working with women on gardening. And after that, we both did master's programs, myself in public health, him in natural resource management, worked in Latin America a little bit. Then we came back to Northern California where we had family and were able to get this property. And I think because we came to it not having been farmers, not having gone through a farming program, we had a different um, set of glasses to look at it. So we actually started by doing good organic tillage and realized very quickly it wasn't working. Our soil was degrading very quickly. We were having a lot of pest problems. So we went, took a couple steps back to look at what were we doing in West Africa? Well, let's try some permanent beds. Oh, and that's gonna help us go year round. And oh, it's going to help us keep our employees year round. And that's what helped us make the transition. So even though I'm speaking to the choir, we're speaking to the choir here in terms of soil carbon, I wanna go quickly in five minutes over soil carbon and tillage because being vegetable farmers, we come from a food production area that is really tillage heavy, really tillage focused, whether you're organic or conventional. Um, so just the real quick basics that you all are aware of, but it's nice to be on the same plane. Organic matter is a small slice of your soil. Most of it's air, water, and mineral. That organic matter is what is the life in your soil. And it's important to note that about half of your organic matter is actually carbon by weight. So when you think about carbon farming and building up soil organic matter, this is the small little sliver of your soil we're talking about here. And according to the USDA, most of our prime agricultural land in the US averaged 6 to 10% organic matter before us humans began farming it. Today we're averaging between 1 and 3% organic matter on those same lands. So after 100 years of farming it, we have dramatically degraded the organic matter in our soils, in our agricultural lands. And in fact, California just announced one year ago in November that we now average only 1% organic matter in our arable lands in California. It keeps going down every year. So that would be the example that we're talking about right here, is we are globally degrading our lands. There is no category on this chart for improved soil. Um, and the only neutral areas are the tundras and deserts, etc. So simple things like the FAO of the United Nations. Tillage is one of the major practices that reduces the organic matter level in the soil. Just clear-cut, straightforward facts that everyone out there is in agreement on. Or globally, roughly two-thirds of the total soil carbon has already been lost from our planet's cultivated soils. Now, if we've already lost two-thirds of the carbon in our arable soils in the past hundred years of mechanized, intensive farming, we don't have another hundred years of soil carbon to do that to. We've already lost more than half of it. What are we going to do for food production at the end of the next hundred year cycle? So for example, one of the ways that we lose nutrients, well, I should actually back up quickly. Um, no, I'll do it here. So for example, I just like this. This is one of dozens and dozens of studies that we're all easily confined. But this was a moldboard plow versus no-till. Oh, I'll look at here. And erosion. And this is a USDA study back in the late, uh, late 70s. And they found that a moldboard plow field had about 4,700 pounds of soil loss per acre per year. That's about 1 14th of an inch. So you couldn't really see 4,700 pounds per acre per year. But every single year it built up. And that was over four different fields over four different years. And that was the total erosion average. Then you look at a no-till field of doing the same crops, same area, same soil, averaged six pounds of soil loss per year per acre. 
That's, that's 700 times, a mold board is a type of heavy duty plow, the kind you picture in the dust bowl with a nice big curve on it and it flips over the sod. So it's a, it's a heavy tillage tool, but honestly, that number of 4,700 pounds per acre per year was half the national average during that time period. In the late 70s, our national average was 9,000 pounds per acre of soil loss per year. So this farm, these farms, their average was really good. It was half the natural average. And yet no-till was 1 700th the amount of erosion. So you can have 700 years of this kind of farming and have the same erosion as one year in that kind of farming. Just to put things in perspective about tillage and crop production, because we are doing crops, specifically vegetable crops. So here we are in drought stricken California, and actually much of our arid west, and the act of tillage, a lot of farmers actually use tillage specifically to dry out their soil so they can work the soil. But if you dry it out, well, you're losing precious water and you're degrading the water holding capacity of the soil, you're degrading the, degrading the actual water in the soil for your biology as well as for your plants. So every single pass of tillage equipment has been shown to remove the equivalent of about a quarter inch of rainfall from the soil. And most vegetable farms will do between three and eight passes of tillage equipment to get the soil ready each year for each crop. So you're removing one to two inches of water from your soil before you even plant your crops. And then finally, you also have the biological impacts of tillage on soil. And this is a great quote. This is the USDA. Tilling the soil is the equivalent of an earthquake, hurricane, tornado, and forest fire occurring simultaneously to the world of soil organisms. Simply stated, tillage is bad for the soil. That's the USDA. The science is very clear on this that tillage degrades the biology in the land, the biology in the soil. And I didn't even specify on the nutrient loss in the soil, but the nutrient loss in the soil is, if you think about it, tillage is kind of like a turbocharger on an engine or a bellows on a forge. You're injecting a lot of oxygen in and breaking up everything that's large aggregates into smaller and smaller sizes, so they have greater surface area to volume ratio, and then they combine with the oxygen being shoved in to form nitrous oxide and carbon dioxide. You're losing your nitrogen and your carbon in your soil, combining with oxygen to create greenhouse gas emissions. So the very act of tillage is removing the two things you as a farmer need most of your soil, nitrogen and carbon, and creating greenhouse gas emissions. A huge double negative. And so that was the nutrient side of things. This is the biology side of things. There have been tests that the USDA has done looking at a single teaspoon of 1% organic matter tilled soil, and it will have tens of yards of fungi, mycorrhizal fungi. Then look at a teaspoon of 6% organic matter untilled soil, and it will have tens of miles of fungi in it. Yards to miles. Again, it's actually like about a six or 700 to one ratio. So that untilled high organic matter level soil has much more biology happening in it. And therefore, as a result, because of all that tillage, because of that loss of two thirds of the carbon in our arable soils through our abuse of the soil, that actually means that agriculture has one of the greatest capacities to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions. We can take all of that carbon in the atmosphere and put it back into the lands where it came from in the first place to build back our soils, because half of organic matter is carbon again. So this is a study done by the EU and the UN, and agriculture has the greatest mitigation potential of CO2 equivalents at the cheapest cost compared to the other sectors of the economy looking at how to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions. And where does that potential come from? 89% of that potential comes from better soil management. It's not rice patties and methane, it's not cow farts and sheep farts, it's very specifically soil. Soil has an enormous capacity to mitigate and put back in so many greenhouse gas emissions. But real quick, also because there's been so, talk, so much talk here about grazing, management. I'd love to show how much grazing management is, but then cropland also definitely has a very large piece in it. So the first one there is cropland management, the second one is grazing land management, then there's restore cultivated organic soil, soils and restore degraded lands. Um, those are your four top ones. And so when we look at tillage in cropping systems, many, many universities, including the Rodell Institute, have done studies, 10-year, 30-year studies, looking at which tillage systems can bring back organic matter the best. And already that's an ironic statement because tillage is what degraded the organic matter in the first place, so they're not thinking outside the box. It's trying to use the same 
tool that got them into the problem to get them out of the problem. But they're looking at how can we man manage tillage to bring back organic matter. And so one of the studies was from UC Davis that I note here, one of them from the Rhode Island Institute. And for some of these, you know, they have 1.9% starting, or 2.1%. And after 23 years, the best was a low input tillage, low tillage use, with high input or animal um, manures. And they had a 0.6 percentage point increase, a little over half percentage point increase over a quarter century through the best organic tillage practices that they could do. And that mimics some of the others. UC Davis, the organic and the um, low input versus conventional. So we see that organic definitely brings back soil health. No question about it. Using organic systems, using organic cover crops, using leguminous cover crops, manures, composts, and doing minimal tillage can slowly bring back the organic matter. We're doing it a little bit differently. We're doing no-till. <laughs> so in our five years of being no-till, we've got an increase from 2.4% original organic matter up to 8 to 11% organic matter in just five or six years of doing no-till. So our increase is absolutely dramatic, bringing it right back to where it used to be and should be for the health of our crops and for the health of all of us and our consumers who are eating the food. Plus, as we get further into this, it makes farming so much easier to have really good soil. Yes. Just sure. so I'm understanding going forward, are you talking organic no-till or um, We are definitely, we are not certified organic, but we meet or exceed all organic standards and we're actually no spray of any kind, um, period. And we do some organic fertilizer and compost and that's about it. So we'll get into it. Okay, so there you saw another picture for, of our farm and we've got a lot more pictures coming on. So just one of the best ways that we have to describe what we're doing is just to go through some um, principles of good soil management. And this can work for vegetable cropping, but can also work for anything else. Um, and we pick these again from the USDA, just because we like to show that they're global. If you go to permaculture, they have similar ones, but they're pretty basic as you'll see we go through. So the first one is disturb the soil as little as possible. Paul sort of just talked about that, so we don't do any tillage. Um, go ahead and go one more. Oh. No, that's great. Uh, perfect. Um, so we create permanent beds, and we just continue to crop. I'll go a little bit more into the detail of this later. So people come to us a lot. So we, if you're not doing any tillage, we want a tool that you're using, not just hand tools of shovels and your hands to transplant. There must be some tool. If you're taking a tractor out of the system, what are you using in its place? The broad fork, we have a picture of it here because it can be one tool that people use depending upon your soil type. It's a good tool for transitioning into doing no-till um, or for starting up. And what it does is it just provides a little bit of aeration in your soil, loosening it up. At this point, we do not use it any longer but I like to have it here because people want a tool to point to. Us humans so, love tools for sure. Yes. So the first one, disturb the soil as little as possible. The second one and third one we sort of group together. Uh, grow as many different species of plants as practical and keep living like, plants in the soil as often as possible. Okay, now you can go. Okay, so uh, again things you all probably know very well, but we want as much photosynthesis as possible. We want to capture that natural energy as much as we can to grow as much food as we can to make as much profit as we can. And this is what's happening. The plants are photosynthesizing for us. They're taking the carbon off of the CO2. They're keeping it and creating glucose, which is the most basic energy packet. They're then resynthesizing that glucose into more complicated sugars, carbohydrates, amino acids, proteins, fats, waxes, so forth and so on. 70% of that they use, well, 60% of that they use for their own growth and development to create the broccoli head that we're then going to eat. But 40% of that they do not use for the, their own direct growth and development, but they push out as exudates into the soil. So that's the exudation, which then increases your soil organic matter. It's increasing the biology in the soil, which we just heard about from um, Judy. And here's the soil food web that's happening. You've got the plants um, uh, producing exudates, feeding the fungi and the bacteria, which are then feeding nematodes and protozoa and arthropods and up and up the... Um, <laughs> So this is what it looks like on our farm. You saw the overhead picture where we had green living plants in the soil throughout the entire farm. 
like you, before when you drive into Pacinus Ranch or even just going through here in Hollister, there are a lot of cabbage fields and other things like that. Right now, what are you seeing? You're seeing bare soil. Um, but we like to have it covered as much as possible with green living plants. Those plants are photosynthesizing for us. They're growing food for us and for our clients and they're making money for us. So keeping that um, in the ground as often as possible is important. We get three to seven sequential economic crops per bed in a 12 month cycle. That is how we're able to make 100,000 gross per acre is by constantly having new crops in the ground. Now, um, I just sort of hit one of those topics, the keep green living plants in the ground. The other one, keeping a diversity of plants in the ground um, is very important. Right here in the foreground, you've got bok choy. I don't wanna do a crop of bok choy followed by a crop of bok choy followed by another crop of bok choy because it's gonna take the same nutrients from the soil and also put down the same nutrients and you're gonna have a buildup of pest problems. So we wanna have a crop of bok choy followed by a lettuce crop, followed by a broccoli crop, followed by a tomato crop, followed by a winter squash crop. So rotating of lots of different things through that system. And because we have a CSA, because we have farmer's markets, we have a diversity of about 120 different uh, varieties that we grow throughout the year. We're up in Sonoma County, so we're about three or four hours north of here. I didn't say that up front. And we're actually in a pretty cool valley bottom. Um, we had uh, sandy loam soils for about two-thirds of the property um, and clay loam soils for about a third of the property um, because we get flooded in um, about a quarter of the property every single year down in the bottom. How long has your farm been in that location? Ten years. So your first year it took a while to build up the... Well, it actually took us a couple years to figure out how we were doing this. Um, but what we found is um, our lowest field, that, the one that floods, uh, we actually did that in tillage up until three years ago because we didn't feel that we could do this um, and then have it get flooded in the winter. And so that field has only three years old and Paul showed you the jump in our organic matter on some of our first fields where it took us five years to go from 2.4 percent up to eight percent and in that new field it took much quicker and also some other farmers that are replicating what we're doing they've had a much quicker jump up in their organic matter so it doesn't have to take that long let's keep going um keep the soil covered all the time Paul I'm gonna let you take that one. Oh sure um so that's just another version of, um, it's not just about keeping photosynthesis constantly going, that's covering your soil, you want to keep photosynthesis always actively happening. So in a good, good organic system, you can have a winter cover crop to catch the winter sunlight to keep feeding the soil. Well, we're doing that with all of our crops all the time and they're all economic. And that's one version of keeping the soil, soil covered. Other versions of keeping the soil covered include mulches, etc. And that's mulches, it's all about protecting that soil and feeding that soil with a living plant mulch, whether it's a dead mulch that you put on there, like dry grass or, or wood chips, or whether it's a green living mulch through clovers and other things, or the green plants, or actual economic crops. So keeping soil covered is very critical. You don't want to have barren exposed soil. First of all, barren exposed soil, the wind and sun both are going to volatilize more nutrients out of the soil and feed the greenhouse gas emissions and deprive your soil. But also, that barren exposed soil is going to be hot daytime, cold night, hot, cold, hot, cold, and the biology doesn't like that. So keeping soil very well covered with dense, tight spacing, lots of cropping in there, um, some Napa cabbages and bold fennel that are getting ready to harvest, and, um, and transplants in the nursery. So one way, I should go to the next one. So one way that we do constant cropping and keeping the soil covered all the time is through the use of transplants. Because if we were to direct seed a crop out there, it would take that crop you know, a week to germinate and then three more weeks to grow until transplant size. That's four weeks that the soil would have been bare and exposed. Those same four weeks we can do in the nursery through our um, transplants. And then we transplant out in the field and we have strong, healthy crops that can go in the ground and almost immediately begin covering the ground and photosynthesizing to feed the soil. So really quickly, to give a very fast picture, a black and white picture of how most farming would transition from one crop to the next, if you have your standing cauliflower plant in the morning you harvest, and you're a typical good organic farm, if you're really good, after harvest, very next afternoon or the next day, you'll come in and plow it all under, then you wait a week or two for it to begin decomposing, and then you blend it up with a rototiller, and then you wait a week or two to do a final pass of tillage, 
then you do your bed shaping, then you do your final pass of tilting on top, then you sow your seeds on week five or six or seven, and you wait a week for the seeds to germinate, and they grow for another three weeks, and then you have a transplant-sized crop. That standing cauliflower crop that we just harvested to the next transplant-sized crop in a typical organic, til organic tillage system would take a minimum of five weeks, and usually seven to 11 weeks. So that's seven to 11 weeks of bare and exposed soil that is being heavily tilled and disturbed repeatedly over that time period. In our system, what we're gonna do is harvest that cauliflower in the morning, and in the afternoon, or midday actually, we'll come back and cut the plant off at or below ground level. Everything above ground is composted, and everything below ground stays whole and intact, that root structure. We'll add a little half inch of compost down, and in the afternoon, transplant the next crop in. So you go from one standing crop that was just harvested to the next transplant size standing crop in a matter of hours in the exact same day or the very next day, not a matter of weeks. So we're keeping constant cover on the soil as well as constant photosynthesis feeding the soil and the root, the rhizosphere, the biology around the root structure of that previous vegetable crop never gets disturbed, never gets deprived of food, never gets blended and chopped up, and it immediately has a new root structure transplanted right next to it that begins growing and they can continue thriving. So your rhizosphere never gets drained of nutrients or blended up. How many days do you have? How many days? I was gonna mention our cold soon. We only have about 110 frost-free window days. Very short, about the same as Anchorage, Alaska. Believe it or not, we've already had five frosts since September 4th this year. Um, we've also had five days over 95 degrees, that same 40 day period. <laughs> so transplants really are a benefit to keeping production high and to keep healthy plants in the ground. If you only have 70% germination of your seeds out in the field, that means 30% of the bed space is wasted, and in fact that 30% of the bed space is gonna grow weeds, so you have more weeding with less crop to harvest. But if you have 70% germination in the nursery, you're only gonna transplant out the healthy crops, so your fields, your economic valuable space, is always gonna have 100% cover of strong, healthy plants. And then by having less by doing transplants, they spend less time in the field. Less time in the field is really critical because obviously it's more crops per year, which is more revenue. It's also less availability to pests. The plants are out there in the fields for less time so that if we get pest issues, it is always at the very, very end of that crop's harvest and at that point, you simply cut the crop, put it in the compost pile, cover it with a compost blanket, and start cooking it. So any aphids that might begin to appear, if we get them, very rarely, they immediately are cleared from the field and composted before they can ever make the next generation of aphids. So we're constantly using intensive approach to growing as one of our pest management methods. So bringing some healthy big bok choy plants out of the nursery and going to the field does go back one, actually. So those bok choy plants are four weeks from seed to transplant, and they'll be in the ground for about four to five weeks now until harvest. Really fast turnover, very good economic crop. Um, here we're putting in some summer squash plants and some kale plants, good dense spacing. These lettuces were just transplanted right when the photo was taken. So those, plant, those beds had been cauliflower in the morning, and then we harvested the cauliflower, cleared the beds of all the above ground detritus, the roots are still in place below, put down a half inch of compost, and put in lettuce, red butterhead lettuce, and those are good large transplants, that that's the very same day we harvested the cauliflower out of that bed. We already have the next crop in, and give it two more weeks, next slide, and that's how big the lettuces will be, is the different bed, different lettuces. But here's an intercropping of cauliflowers with lettuces. Those cauliflowers are actually not your standard whitehead or purplehead cauliflower, they're the big Romanesco fractal flower, the ones that spiral. They are huge heirloom plants, very large plants. So when you transplant them, you only do two lines, 24 inch spacing because the plants get big. When you do two line, 24 inch spacing of that Romanesque cauliflower, and you look at your bed afterwards, it's like, wow, that's a lot of unused bare dirt in between all those plants. What if we did alternating lettuces in between and a third line of lettuce on the middle? So what we end up with is a full 100% crop of cauliflower, a 70% crop of lettuce in the same space at the same time, the lettuce is now protecting the soil better, it's suppressing weeds, it's actually increasing available moisture content by protecting the soil, and meanwhile, as these grow together, the cauliflower is giving light shade and light wind break and to lettuces to create better quality lettuce, then the lettuce harvests out and the cauliflower fills in and we get a full crop of cauliflower. So we get a factor of 1.7 crops per bed, co-benefiting, they're mutually benefiting each other and using less water to do it. 
Example of tomatoes with S rolls and endives on the sides, or tomatoes with red butterhead lettuce on the sides. We can often get two crops of lettuce on the shoulders of a tomato bed before the tomatoes from transplant to beginning harvest. That allows for a single 100 foot bed could bring in almost $2,000 of lettuce between when you transplant the tomatoes and when you begin harvesting the tomatoes. And meanwhile, you get $2,000 of lettuce out of that single 100 foot bed, and it just benefits tomatoes all along. Here we got leeks going. Do two or three crops of mini romaine lettuces down the middle of the leeks. Again, co benefits. Keeping full fennel in the middle of Brussels sprouts there. Brussels sprouts take forever to grow. The full fennel is much quicker, so you can get one to come up really fast. Gives a little bit of light shade to the Brussels sprouts in the beginning of late summer. And then the full fennel harvests out, and the Brussels sprouts can take over and fill out as fall and winter come on. So, I want to kind of mention quickly the transitioning of beds. And honestly, I'd like to get to some other employee stuff. So I want to keep us on schedule. So if you can go fast with these ones, let's get straight to the video. Okay. So you clearing the bed, oh, clearing the bed, raking it flat if we want to, um, putting on any organic fertilizers, of which we use maybe a calcium um, oyster shell is the white. And then we have a little bit of compost, quarter inch, half inch. And transplanting, watering in, and then cover them as appropriate and keep going to the video. So, oh, went fast. Here is three people clearing four 90 foot beds in one hour. They're doing the clearing, the prepping, the transplanting, and the watering in all in one hour. And we'll play this a second time for you. So, it's about two and a quarter wheelbarrows over a 90 foot bed of compost. There's barely a quarter inch to half inch. There's the next round of plants going in. Gotta have a coffee break. <laughs> and back to work. <laughs> you can see the ecological hedgerows to the right and to the left. We got some annual flowers along the front. This was done in April, um, sort of mid-April of this year. Watering in and done. <laughs> so let's see it again, but that was three people, four 90-foot beds in one hour. And that was taking the crops that had already been harvested just simply clearing them, preparing the bed, transplanting, watering in. That's the amount of turnover time, and that's the amount of constant photosynthesis maintained in the soil without disturbance at all. You can also see all four of these beds have a double crop with a lettuce as well as a brassica in there. Yeah, there's cauliflowers here with green lettuce in between, there's red lettuce in between. Here was cauliflower on the outside with uh, dill down the middle. I think it'll uh, Yes. Okay. Oh. So, Ooh. go backwards. Let's do it one more time quickly. And here we go. Just to give an idea, so all of the above ground growth is going to the compost pile. And it's going to make that compost, it's going to come back to other future beds. And then we whip the irrigation hoses off the beds, put down, uh, there's an oyster shell, and an organic feather meal is the tannish color. The compost, and transplanting is already happening. And one person can transplant about 5,000 plants in a 10 hour day, one person alone. So this is not a, it may be, it may seem laborious, but when you're trained in a really good system, you can get a lot done quickly. We don't mechanize, we stay with people. And I think that's actually a very good point that we want to make later on, is that we invest in people. And we don't have machinery, we don't have tillage, we don't have all the tractors and equipment, we don't have transplanters or seeders. It's people that we rely on, and we hire, and we keep, and they're our family, we love. Our family. What was the sure. tall crop on the right side that was still pretty tall that you were taking? It was a flowering mustard. We had been harvesting leaves from it for quite a while, and then boom, we just had a heat wave in April and it said, done. <laughs> so, oh. um, okay. so as we've mentioned already, um, as we mentioned already, we're simply growing three to seven sequential crops year round, and those crops, she's also video. Uh, you're fine. <laughs> and those crops, are all, they're all of them are cover crops. There's no non-economic cover crop in the winter with one or two economic crops in the summer. They're all cover crops, and they're all economic. And that's the mindset I really want to switch if you get away from tillage and start thinking about always being able to grow food on a constant basis. They are all cover crops protecting your soil and feeding your soil, and they're all economic, which is so useful to a production system, especially when you have high land value like in Sonoma County, where we are. And I think I mentioned before that part of what 
ended up taking us year round was employees, but also we're in Sonoma County, our property taxes are exorbitant and we needed to pay for those. And partially we just wanted to do permanent beds. So for us, we continue going through the winter. So somebody asked how many growing days we have. Well, we're still growing in the winter. You can see the hoarfrost here on this um, Brussels sprout plant. We do have some uh, in-ground hoop houses uh, and then we do some winter crops uh, and then we also have some root storage crops, winter squash and things like that, that take us through the winter. So there. So briefly, we're at 315. Oh, okay. And I want to cruise, I want to get the people part again. Yeah, no, definitely. But it's the people that had brought us to doing year round. And specifically, we had two fantastic employees uh, one year. And the prior two years when we had done tillage, we had put in a winter crop a crop, as is the norm for good organic tillage based vegetable. But we had these two employees and we realized with both of them in their specific situations, if we put in a cover crop and then didn't have any work for them from November through February, we would lose them. And not only would they not have that stability, we wouldn't be able to have these people that were fantastic and we had already trained in our system come back the next year. So by having year round employment for people, it makes a much more stable workforce rather than people coming and going. And that's highly important to us. So as I mentioned, we are definitely no spray of any kind, not organic sprays, not conventional sprays. Um, and we basically have no pests, no viruses, no diseases, no pathogens. And I've sort of enjoyed this. Um, your, your sprays don't read little name tags saying beneficial or pest insect. They kill indiscriminately for the most part, and they will kill your beneficials and your pests. Um, he's, he's talking about gophers. Yeah, this is this is spraying for insects. You know, gophers are a different story. But with your insects, if you're spraying, you're going to wipe out your praying mantids and your lady beetles just as easily. You're going to wipe out your aphids and your flea beetles. So when you do that, guess which ones come back faster? The pests. Are. So then you're on a pesticide treadmill. So I want to cruise to the ecology part, but here's an example of a hedgerow. That hedgerow is about three years old. We do a lot of hedgerows on the property of perennial, native, pollinator-friendly plantings that benefit pollinators by offering flowers all year round, so those food sources year round. Plus, they provide habitat for beneficial insects. There's been lots of studies done showing that beneficial insects with longer lifespans need stable habitat, and they live in perennial hedgerows. Pest insects with short lifespans don't care where they live, kind of like cockroaches and rats, so the pest insects live in the annuals. So if you want pest insects, have lots and lots of annual flowers and annual weeds and annual grasses and annuals around. But if you really want to encourage beneficials on your farm, focus on perennials, woody, twiggy perennials that are bush shrubs, tight, dense branch structure, and you know, high trees can help too, and low perennial grasses can help, but those bushes really create habitat for beneficial insects and pollinators. So don't go any further, Paul, but if we didn't have, this is taking up space that we could have an economic crop in, but it is so important to us. I mean, you could have those, those beds going an extra six feet and have a lot more crop coming out of there, but having a place for our beneficials so that we don't have problems with our pests, so we don't have to spray is really important. Not only the insects, but it's also a wonderful place for our snakes, which will help with our voles and um, and songbirds, and windbreak yes. for the crops so that we have less water loss. We're going to cruise for a little while and do some Q&A, um, but we have less water loss through evapotranspiration and transpiration. We have protection for the crops. They grow better. We all like to be out of the wind. Your crops are the same way. Your soil is the same way. They don't want to be in full sun and full wind. They want a little bit of protection. So hedgerows can really modify the ambient climate around your crops, and we've seen five foot tall hedgerows like this giving up to three or four degrees of frost protection up to 20 feet away. And only five feet high, but it's 20 feet away, they will be giving frost protection to crops. Yeah. We've had this proven to us multiple times. Just farm. even earlier, about a month ago. And we got about 85% of our hedgerows put in through USDA grants that our local RCD office helped us obtain. And this example of a hedgerow here, to your left 20 feet, is a 140 acre conventional vineyard, our neighbor. And to the right 40 feet are our vegetable beds. We have this wonderful double hedgerow with a nice wooded pathway between. So we've planted all those bushes and trees along the edges. And of course this helps our native bee populations, not just our domesticated honeybee. And this helps our snake and beneficial insects. Um, that is a garter snake that is constricting a bowl. Unusual, but great. We only knew of it because the poor bowl was being eaten from behind snake, and we heard snake. it. Oh my, that was exciting. Um, and baby quail that got separated from his mom, so we had to go reintroduce it. 
um, more snakes in the, as a baby garter snake in a mini or main lettuce bed, um, bluebird nesting boxes and swallow nesting boxes, and turtles in our ponds. We have seven different ponds on the property. They come out in February, March to find some dirt and dig a little hole, lay their eggs. The eggs get incubated in the soil. When they hatch, the baby turtles head back to those ponds. That's a quarter. That's a baby turtle. <laughs> it's amazing how tiny they are. Um, so having the ecology in next to our annual crops is highly important in our system and is what allows us to not do any sprays. And by being yes. really intensive and doing That's a second part. transplants and having a little quarter inch or half inch compost going down between each crop, that intensivity and that fast turnover is part of our weed management as well. So through all these pictures you've seen, you've seen almost no weeds and 95 to 98% of those beds out there have never been weeded. We don't do weeding at our vegetable farm and it's awfully lovely. Actually our employees, almost all of them have worked at prior other organic farms and they all tell us that they love the fact that they don't do any weeding. And you can, in your backyard garden, say that weeding is very meditative, but if you get rid of it, you enjoy it, I Even promise you. <laughs> so we haven't really mentioned water use, but when we began, we said we had about 2.4% organic matter and we were doing tillage in the first couple of years. And at that point, we were also watering with our drip irrigation system. We were watering about two to three hours of drip two to three times a week. At this point, as the organic matter level has gone up to eight to 10% or 11%, we're now irrigating between 20 and 30 minutes or 20 and 40 minutes twice a week. So our irrigation use has gone down to a sixth or an eighth of what we used to do in the same original soils and same crops, but actually higher productivity and higher organic matter and therefore less water use. As we didn't mention, but every single percentage point of organic matter that you add to soil, you can increase the water holding capacity of an acre of land by about 16 to 20,000 gallons of extra available water in the top 12 inches. So if you go from 2.4% back up to 8 or 10% organic matter, you've increased the water holding capacity around 100,000 gallons per acre in just the top foot of soil. Yes. Yeah. And we said we're cold in our valley bottom. These are our children harvesting eggplants and peppers wearing wool hats and jackets. We're cold. <laughs> so For Northern California. Yes. So, um, go for it. I mean, oh, I'll get this one. Right. Yeah. So this is just sort of a good, we like context. California vegetable farms on average have about $1,900 of gross revenue per crop acre per year. Organic veg is almost double that because organic does command a higher price. And when you get to the small scale diversified direct market vegetable farms, like all the farmers at the farmer's market, they're mainly organic, they're direct market, they're small scale, they're much better productivity levels because they are small scale and they're diversified and they're intensive. Vineyards in Sonoma County are roughly the same. About $11,000 gross revenue per crop acre per year is the average. That was actually pretty high just seven years ago. It was only $7,000, so it's really gone up recently. We live in wine country, so everybody thinks vegetables can't make money. You need to take out vegetables and put in grapes because you'll make money doing wine. And then some people that are in the business of certifying organic farms and UC Santa Cruz, they'll say that you really need about 14,000 per crop acre per year to be economically viable as a vegetable grower. And so most of our friends slash competitors at the farmer's markets, they're usually doing between about 15 and $25,000 per crop acre per year. So they're in that range and they're our competitors and they're doing great. And so, for example, like UC Davis Student Farm, 17.5, our local junior college organic farm is doing about 14.5, and we're up there at about $100,000 per crop acre per year in productivity. It works. It's important. <laughs> Um, our revenue streams, I just mentioned this briefly, but um, uh, when we started, we started off very small, just with a CSA, just learning, and that was about 100% of our income. As we've grown, the CSA has become less and less of our income, even though, as you can see, it's grown. This chart doesn't have 2016, but honestly, our most recent numbers really are mirroring 2015, so, uh, not much change there. Um, uh, farmers markets about 53% to 55% and then restaurant and wholesale anywhere from 9 to 15% um, and that's a really nice mix it's really nice to be diversified uh, there are some studies on CSA farms in California showing that uh, CSA farms can be very good and very profitable for the farmers when it's one of several different markets that you utilize, and we found that to be true. We like it also, be, um, 
One of the things we like about growing year round also is that we keep our customers, first of all with a CSA, so that every spring I don't have to be like, hey, come join us for the CSA again. Do you remember how great it was this year? So people don't actively have to say yes, they have to actively say no. Uh, this is Ingrid packing some of our CSA boxes. The same thing for our farmers markets. Our local farmers markets in February, March and April, we actually have our highest sales in those months because other vegetable producers, they might just have light greens or something like that where we have a whole array of things. In fact, I believe this is the early spring market that Nina is selling at here um, where we've got beets and leeks and radishes and fennel and lettuce and eggs and actually, various different greens. We get up to like 24 to 28 different vegetable items at any given farmer's market for most of the year. Right. And then we look next door and it's usually 9 to 12. Right. So diversity brings customers. And when we have those vegetables, those 28 different varieties, for instance, in December and January and February and March, all of the customers are used to buying from us. So come April, May, and June, when the number of vendors at market goes from 10 to 45 or 50, those people are used to already buying from us they continue buying from us. So staying at the markets year round is just, is really wonderful us, for us. And also when the number of our competitors at the market increases by fourfold, the number of customers actually dips. Because you get into summer vacation, everybody's traveling, everybody has their own garden. And so the competition in summer is really challenging and we've actually turned it into our off season so that our sales in July and August are very low and we're really spending our time prepping for winter because we know we're gonna make our money there. And while we're doing so, we're keeping our employees. And these are them, this is our family. Um, so there's Paul and I in the upper right, our kids are intermixed. Um, Miguel down there has been with us for about three years. Greg is here at the conference, he's new with us. We've got a couple of interns here They're, uh, from Israel. We had a high school student over the summer. We always try and have one high school student over the summer. It's just fun, young energy. Nina in the middle there with the blue shirt, she's been with us for two and a half years. Her sister was working with us for two years prior than that. Uh, John in the green shirt, he was with us for four and a half years. Olivia, and uh, she comes and goes. Julie, um, she did Peace Corps with us in West Africa and just works very part-time. Um, another intern over here, and Yvonne, who's fantastic, who's been with us for about half a year. So um, just a wonderful crew of people constantly um, turning over, having some new faces and trying to keep some uh, steady faces as well. We're actually, uh, this winter, because we lost <laughs> Um, he has other family commitments. Um, we're going to be hiring two full-time positions this winter, so we're excited about that. But it's been really awesome for us to have this huge family of people that make our farm happen. And most of them are part-time by their choice. We actually, almost every single one of them, we want to hire more hours. We want more of them on the farm because they are awesome and they really know what's going on and they get it but they also want a really rich and full life and they have other obligations or other interests. And that's terrific because it means we're actually paying them enough so they can have other interests and other things to do or other time off. And so nobody here works more than a 40 hour work week. These are all 40 hours a week or less. And some of them are as little like Julie. Julie comes just one day a week to help with harvest for CSA. So she's five hours a week. And that would be the low end of the spectrum. But most people here are sort of 15 to 25 hours a week, with a few of them being 40 hours a week. Nobody is doing the 10 hour a day, six days a week schedule that most vegetable farms are doing. And that really means something to me for quality of life. And our pay, definitely our starting pay is much higher than most other farms that we're competing with in our county, that their eventual pay is, their eventual pay they get to, our starting pay is a little bit higher than that. So that's pretty well. Um, and we're basically running out, running the Q&A at this point, right? I think so. So, yeah. Um, I think we got how many acres? Uh, three acres of production. I'll actually leave it right there. So let's do a few minutes of Q&A before we run out. Okay. Uh, with, with your uh, composting, your, your, is it just the grape manures or are you have laying hens and you mix it with chicken litter? Or? Our compost is about 50% our green manure and then about 50% that we buy in from our municipal composting site. As a farmer, I'm in the business of exporting water, but also nutrients off of my farm every day. 
And so I need to have a way to bring those back. We use a little bit of organic fertilizer as part of that, but my ideal and what we strive for is if I sell you a head of cauliflower, you chop off the rest, plus you add some of your waste from your garden and put it on the, um, on the street in your green bin and it gets picked up by a municipal site, composted, and then I'm able to purchase it for a reasonable price and bring it back. That in my mind is a wonderful loop to keep nutrients in our cycle and bring them you know, let me sell you a head of cauliflower and then bring them back again to my farm. Conversely, what happens is we send nutrients off the farm all the way to cities and they create waste. And that waste, if it's biological waste, like food leftovers, that biological waste creates methane emissions and other leachates that both poison the oceans and poison the atmosphere as well. So we have mostly this straight throughput system that creates waste at the ends. And actually, as Dr. Kate Scow of UC Davis said, um, cities are essentially human CAFOs human concentrated animal feeding operations. We have nothing but antibiotics and nutrients and energy and food going in and creating waste. And what we need to do is turn that back into a cycle, a closed loop cycle where the nutrients leave the farm, go to the community and come back to the farm again. So we're looking at it as a farm as one sort of nutrient, one part of the nutrient loop and all of our food goes within a 15 mile radius of the farm and all our compost comes back in within a 15 mile radius. All that compost is certified for organic use or biodynamic use. And I'm actually going to ask the question that we often get, which is, is this scalable? How fantastic you're, you know, grossing 100,000 on three acres, so let's do it on 100 acre. Yes. yes. Um, uh, and the answer that I'm going to have is, um, we don't want to 100 acre farms 100 miles away from the city center. We would rather have... 52 and one and two and three acre farms very close in to the community being a part of the community employing community members and closing that loop getting rid of all the transportation costs not just the people going out there but the food coming back in the compost coming back out getting rid of all the transportation and starting to grow food and hire people to grow that food right in the communities themselves i mean with the veg just more small farms a lot more small yeah farms. with vegetable production that's ideal you've had your hand up for a while in the hat Absolutely. Yeah, when we started and when we got the um, USDA grants to put them in, our focus was really focusing on pollinators and trying to keep our pollinators there. We do have a couple of medicinals, specifically medicinal elderberry, that we absolutely love because it holds all the same functions as all of the other pollinator-friendly plants. However, we don't do any management of it. I get. 20 pounds of elderberries per large bush, and I sell those for $16 a pound with very little management. So yes, there are a couple that we do. I would like to have more, and if I were to redo it, I think I would put more uh, fruiting bushes and so forth but you can in do it. Sages and rosemaries and, and yeah, and we also have some herbs in there. But continue. So briefly Absolutely. on the importance of hedgerows, Costa Rica has a payment for environmental services program. It's been in place for a couple decades at this point. For a long time, hedgerows were not considered valuable. They looked at woodlots and revitalizing natural areas and planting trees. There was enough push to actually begin researching hedgerows. And hedgerows went from being not counted in the PES system, the payment for environmental services, to being the highest valued part of the PES system. So hedgerows have been known or have been proven scientifically to have far more value in many different regions on your farm than even just woodlots and other native plant things. So hedgerows really are critical. Yes. We only have about a minute or two left. We have a minute or two left, and I want to hear Brock Bowman next. He's awesome. So in straight in the back. Um, you We used to have two or three hundred laying hens in the property, and we got so good at vegetables, there was no room for the chickens anymore, because their productivity per acre with hens is just minuscule compared to what we get out of vegetables. So one of our main farm managers, he actually was also doing a couple hundred hens on our property, and we just sold him all the hens, and he peeled them off onto his own five acres, and he's doing about six to eight hundred hens now for us for laying eggs, and we sell 100% of what he produces. We just guarantee sell everything. Actually, he does yeah. use our scraps to yeah. feed his chickens. Yeah. yeah, so it stays in that loop. And he's also doing very good pasture management, rotational grazing for his hens, so he can really manage constant green cover on all of his dirt. That way you have constant insect life, because the chickens really want the insects, not the grass. Yeah. 
Uh, how about here with the blue shirt has had his hand up for a while. We did start with those raised beds. That was our intention. And that's because we are very cold. We want to get more solar gain on the edges to warm them, but we didn't want to mislead overhead sunlight in the middle of the day. So that was our intention. Plus it helps with moisture management in the winter. Um, if we were in the hot, dry tropics, like in the sub-Saharan Africa where we started this, we actually had sunken beds to help protect from the excessive heat there and excessive sunlight. So it really varies contextually. And yeah. last question I'll say. Do you know how many gallons you use? Um, Gallons of water, we're still putting the water meter on after we get to this frost cycle, so next April we'll put it back on. But um, we don't know specifically on gallons, we can guesstimate because each emitter is a half gallon per hour emitter. So we can do guesstimates, but you never quite know if it's emitting exactly a half gallon per hour. Do you have a guesstimate? I... No, not yet. We haven't put it on <laughs> What we do know is what he said before, which is when we started out with our 2% organic matter, we were doing 50 minutes about every other day. And that's what we see others of our friends, the small diversified farmers, um, at farmers markets doing and now we're doing about 25 to 30 minutes every four or five days so we're doing about a quarter of that so we reduced by a quarter and thank you very much